Mark. Yeah. Give him a little check, check. But also, I've got a big boy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the Drama Book Show at the Drama Book Shop. Yeah. Uh, I'm David Regal. I host the, uh, the Drama Book Show. In case you're not aware, you are at a live recording of our podcast, The Drama Book Show. Uh, so if you are not yet following The Drama Book Show, you can get it wherever you get your podcast. We are distributed through the Broadway Podcast Network. But uh, if, you, if you're on Apple Music or, uh, or Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you're not following us on social media yet, we are on Instagram at Drama Book Show Podcast. So you can follow us there. And you all have to sign up on Eventbrite to be here tonight. How many? It's just the intro. You haven't missed anything. Uh, you all have to sign up on Eventbrite to be here tonight. So uh, you can also subscribe to us on Eventbrite and you can see whenever we have more events coming up. Uh, so that you can be the first to reserve. So tonight we are here, getting my prop copies, tonight we are here uh, to celebrate Christina Bejan and uh, her publications of Buchenwald as well as Finally Quiet, Four Plays from Bucharest to Washington, D.C. And you are really in for a treat. We have a special guest to talk a little bit first uh, to introduce uh, Christina and, and these books. Uh, it is, uh, we've got the director of the Romanian Cultural Institution of New York, Dorian Brania. Did I say that right? Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's um, freeing to be here tonight in this legendary place. Uh, it's, it's in this fantastic temple of um, playwriting and acting and, uh, and directing and theater. Um, it is a, a truly, uh, a truly a special, uh, special evening uh, because we are launching uh, the latest book of a, um, a very important Romanian American um, um, writer, playwright, many, many other things. Uh, Christina Bejan. Of course, there are so many, uh, so many ways in introducing. Um, uh, Christina. One may say that she is a uh, uh, fantastic scholar, uh, the author of one of the best books uh, about um, fascism in uh, Europe, in Romania particularly, um, that have been published in the past, I don't know, 20, uh, 30 years. One may also say that uh, Christina is a uh, brilliant poet, uh, with, uh, with many, uh, many very, very interesting and touching uh, poetry books. One may describe her as an um, activist, uh, very present in the social life, in the arena, in the social arena, working for um, all sorts of just uh, causes, necessary causes, urgent causes. But I would say, because we are good friends and for, uh, for a long time, to me, she has always been um, the closest definition, contemporary definition, of a Renaissance person. Because she, is, um, she excels in, uh, in everything. She excels as a, as a historian, as a, uh, as a scholar. She excels as a writer. She is a fantastic actor. Uh, and uh, of course, she's very much involved with everything that uh, surrounds us in the social issues um, of, uh, of today. Um, she uh, has been trained, has been educated in, in a, over, a family of overachievers to be the best. And to me, she has always been the best in so many, in so many respects. And I'm sure that with this book of, uh, of playwriting, this book of trauma, um, she is, if not best, but among the best uh, in um, uh, playwriting today in, uh, in the United States. Um, I'm happy for, uh, for you, uh, Christina. I congratulate you for this uh, wonderful appearance. My only regret is that we are talking about this book and not seeing these wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, uh, plays uh, perform. So um, let's make a deal. It is today, you know, we're showing the book and we'll read a little bit from, uh, from the book. 
but very soon we move a couple of blocks away to uh, <laughs> the famous theater district here in New York City to see this play uh, performance. Congratulations, um, and thank you for being here tonight. You are in for a treat. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, It's got to be something to be called the best of the overachievers. <laughs> And I'm gonna I'm gonna read out to you some of those achievements. I'm gonna tell you some things that you probably already know. Uh, Christina Pejan, PhD, is a multilingual Romanian American theater artist, historian, and spoken word poet living in Denver, Colorado. A playwright since age 14. We have something in common. She attended Northwestern University, planning to become a Shakespearean actor. She got derailed by the library, which won her a Rhodes Scholarship to study at the University of Oxford and a Fulbright to study at the University of Bucharest. The author of two award-winning books, History and Poetry, Bejan worked at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and was contributor for their Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos, Volume 3. Bejan has written 19 plays, and her work has been produced in four countries. More recently, her collaboration with James Brunt, The Scholarship, appeared at the Barons Court Theatre in London as a staged reading after an online production by Theatre 29 in Denver and Bucharest Inside the Beltway. Her most successful play, District Lamb, which we will be hearing a little bit about tonight, sold out DC's Capital Fringe Festival and was bought for TV development. Her favorite play, Colombo Calling, a play from Sri Lanka, has had a staged reading at the Kennedy Center. The most unusual thing about her as a playwright is that she was approached by the World Bank to write plays for development when she lived in, I'm about to ask you how to say this one. Vanuatu. Vanuatu in the South Pacific. Launching her plays at the Drama Bookshop is definitely, her words not mine, the coolest thing that has ever happened to her. After all, she is the rent generation and NYC will always be the center of the universe. Please visit ChristinaABejan.com and check out her socials, and we'll talk more about that. And you've got uh, you've got stuff about her upcoming stuff. And we've got all sorts of stuff to do when we get to the sign the table. But now, please help me in welcoming Christina A. Bejan. Are not just in our community, but they have always been my idols, and 
I have looked up to them for a really long time. And you know Mika, ever since her mom was my French professor. Um, and it's just an honor to have an anthology of plays, um, honestly, in the same shelf as theirs. So, yeah, that's it for now. It's an honor to be here. Um, and yeah, shall we do it? Yeah, let's do this. Uh, so we were talking upstairs a little bit. Um, so these, the, the plays and Finally Quiet were written <coughs> separately, um, but are now published as a collection. So I wanted to just know um, what what inspired each of the plays, and uh, of your 19 plays, why these plays in a collection? Um, well, bless you. Oh, goodness. Well, I wanted to bear in mind that, well, Cook and Ball came out before Finally Quiet. It came out a month before, so March 2023, and then Finally Quiet um, was published April 2023. And I wanted to go with my strongest work. And I knew that these five in total were my strongest because they all have a robust production history. Um, depending, they have a uh, great press uh, attached. District Land is the obvious one. We had a absolutely rock star review in the Washington Post, which you can still find online if you're curious. Um, so I wanted to go with the ones that I knew were um, the best. And I also wanted with the anthology to create um, a book that really reflected the di my diversity as a playwright. So To Those Who Haven't Stopped Thinking is um, a dystopian, um, futuristic drama that is a commentary on totalitarianism. And so when a totalitarian regime falls, then what happens? It is directly inspired by Romania. <laughs> um, and I wrote it um, after the first time that I lived in Romania by myself, which was as a college intern um, at Freedom House. That was my college, you know, Americans have our college internships. Um, and my, my, I <laughs> got to live with a friend of the family in their family apartment in Bucharest oh. and work at Freedom House for a summer. And um, that's what inspired to those who haven't stopped thinking. It is a very famous quote um, in Romanian intellectual life. Um, perhaps recognized by Sidney Nod, Stuart Lotel, Sidney Nod. Joanna Cornea, she, she said this. Um, so she was a dissident against the communist regime. And um, then District Land, that is an absurd satire. I mean, it's absolutely Ionesco inspired, um, but it's also skewer skewering. Um, American ambition and all of the young people who descend on Washington, D.C. with not just these big dreams, but like taking themselves way too seriously. <laughs> um, and I was approached, so District Land is a total collab. I don't just write, you know, in a vacuum. Um, I was doing the D.C. Film Festival, the 48 hour film festival every year with a group of friends, filmmakers, and they wanted me to write a film script about young Washington. And we came up with all the characters together. Um, and I remember I was working at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars at the time. And when everybody left at 5 p.m., I would start working on District Land and like stay there until they kicked me out at 10 p.m. Um, and Blair Rubel, who is a dear friend, and he was, um, he was the director of the Kennan Center, which is the Soviet Studies and Russia Studies Center at, at the Wilson Center. He's retired, but he was District Land's first reader. And I was very fortunate to have people like Blair in my corner who were part of the cultural, um, like the mover and shakers of Washington who knew what good art was. And um, so he gave me the first critique on District Land and then we did it in friends, um, houses and apartments had readings and there was this buzz about it that people wanted to, like, we wanna perform this, this is so cool. And it became clear that it wasn't gonna be a film that it was going to be a play. And so it's like, OK, if you guys want to do this so much, let's be in the Capitol Fringe Festival. And the rest is history. We sold out the festival. We had an extended run. District Land was the show to see that summer. Everybody was wearing their District Land t-shirt. At the Romanian War Festival, mm -hmm. every summer I had friends come up in the District Land t-shirt to visit our booth. Mm -hmm. Look, Christina, I saw the t-shirt. Um, so District Land was a phenomenon. And this local filmmaker <laughs> bought it. and. Um, he did create a pilot, and he was shopping it around networks, but this was before the streaming era. 
Um, and it was also right before um, the election, the presidential election. And district land is very much about the Obama years, and it is my um, suspicion that district land was no longer interesting to studio executives once Trump was elected. That's my suspicion. Um, and then finally, quiet, it's a mental health play. I have my own mental health journey, and um, that's a big reason why being here tonight that everyone is so, so meaningful. Um, and I worked closely with the National Alliance for Mental Illness in Washington. Um, and we, so I, I wrote the play and we produced it in the DC Black Theater Festival, uh, promoting NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. So that's very much a family drama. It's, it is an activist play, an advocacy play. Like Dorian said, I'm constantly championing causes that are important, you should pay attention. So mental health is one. Um, and then the final one is a spook on a spook. Uh, theater J, which is the Jewish theater in Washington, D.C., had a contest. That was when Aaron Posner's Life Sucks, Life Sucks in the Present Ridiculous was the hit play in D.C., which is a spook on a Albania. And so Theater J um, had this contest that can you write the best 10 minute spoof on Posner's spoof? So it requires some real insider knowledge of Chekhov. Um, and so we'll hear a little bit of that one tonight. And that, so that was performed at Theater J and most recently was performed in the Women's Theater Festival in Colorado Springs in Colorado. So yeah, that's the, the oh, and Buchenwald. Buchenwald. <laughs> Inspired by my visit to the concentration camp, um, I studied abroad in college, uh, not to Romania. I first I studied in Ger Germany. Um, my first foreign language is German, and it, it, no offense to the Romanians in the house, but it will always be my favorite foreign language, German. Which, um, and so I was a student there, and we visited um, as a class the concentration camp, and I saw. Um, it was a single cell chalk chamber where they would put prisoners in there and cover the whole cell with chalk and you were punished, you were beaten if you moved and they saw a mark that the chalk had been um, you know, dusted aside because of any kind of movement in the cell that was of course a torture chamber. And so in my imagination, I thought, well, what would happen if the camp commandant was imprisoned in that chalk chamber himself following the war when the Soviet army occupied all of the Nazi camps. Um, that's not something that people discuss a lot. The camps were continued to be in use, not to mention the, the prisoners and victims of the Holocaust who were still in DP camps at the time for years. So I explore that period right after World War II, and it's the Nazi commandant imprisoned in this chalk chamber in his own concentration camp, being guarded by a young Soviet soldier. And um, you're gonna hear a little bit of that one too. That one, I was amazed when I looked back. I was like, this was written in 2004? Because there are lines. I, did, I didn't hear everything that was being rehearsed upstairs, so I don't know fully what excerpt, but there were lines when I was like, well, that was written yesterday. So there, I don't know if it was unintentionally prescient or if the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> But why don't we bring in some actors yes, to hear absolutely. some of your work? So we have uh, we have some actors who are gonna they're gonna come out. They're gonna take these music stands, and then uh, you'll get to see them perform some of Christina's work, and then you'll uh, you'll get to meet them a little bit after. So come on out. short excerpts from four out of the five plays, and we're just going to dive in. To those who haven't stopped thinking, a dystopian fantasy play about philosophy, love, and saving the universe. Scene one, gates to the city of the universe. You there, halt! Bebop jumps out from behind a heap of debris and shines a red pointer light at Hannah. Rocksteady appears from behind another heap, but he does not speak. What are you? Why are you? Do you need? Go away! Oh, hello. I knew someone must be around. I'm, I'm so sorry, excuse me, but do you know where the members of the Hell Brigade are? They're expecting me. 
Why give you information? What are you? What do you want with us here? I have only good intentions, I promise. Good? <laughs> Funny you. To speak of goodness in a land of fear. I don't understand. I mean, I don't mean you or the universe any harm. I don't care what you mean. And harm is welcome. Harm is what we know. What? I don't know you. I don't welcome you. But I'm here to help. I just didn't expect to find a place so deserted. Expect? Where you come from? A land of expectation? I can tell. You don't speak our language. Not good. What do you speak? What are you? I am from the beyond. The beyond? I heard it once. Unreachable, unattainable. We can't get there. Yes, I know you can't. Why you come here? Beyond, big, better, wonderful? Yes, I know it is, but I came to help. I want things to get better here in the universe. <laughs> you are funny. And the Hell Brigade? They have plans for Extermination me. of the Hell Brigade, miss. That is what happened. It was. It is not anymore. Although, I heard a bit about new helpers popping up here and there after the fall. I came to help them do good. Well, that is a silly idea. That is why I am here. That is why you are? How odd. The Hell Brigade was not to do good. It was to. Well, what was it then? Another effort to remain what we all are? Yes, and that is? Survivors. You don't know survival? We are all. Being a helper is one way to survive. Why many new helpers? Not surprising. People still need roles to play after the fall. Many roles in one day. Survival. There are rules you must follow now when you are here. I list the rules. A constitution? The politician made the rules after the fall. The people agreed to these rules. Could not survive without rules. So what are they? Two rules. Many. Two very important. Two the most necessary. Uh, uh, I, I can never remember how to say them, but two words that mean the rules, two words that make me behave rightly, exploit and evil. Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly. Worry not, you will see the rules soon. Bebop and Hannah walk around in silence a bit. Hannah goes in and gazes in intent interest at the universe. Bebop tries to look cool and in control. In the middle of the stage stands the politician on a box in a pose of oratory. And if we want the universe to flourish, we need everyone to play a role. And as a person, I believe we each have a part to play in our cosmos. If every man plays his part, which is only his, then we will have order. Order and dependence on that order is security, survival. After the fall, we can't risk falling again. Remember, I know the world and what the world demands of man. We all must use each other, and in using each other, we will survive. No man is sufficient on his own. No man is independent. He will perish who tries. He alone does not have the resources. Everyone's resources lie in everyone else. And we need people to allocate the resources. Manage the resources. Manage the people in the universe. That is the role of the politician. That is my role. <laughs> that is why I am. He is politician. Yes, I got that. You listen to me about your future, about your whole life, about the universe, because I possess the answers. Why do I possess the answers? Because I make the laws. I make laws to decide how the universe will work. Without laws, there will be chaos. Fall oh, was chaos. Chaos. Disaster. Was it? Why, yes. People totally free, running around without direction, everyone thinking and wanting and doing new things. Scary. The 
politician makes the plan. He creates the order necessary. Buchenwald, Nazi SS colonel and camp commandant imprisoned in his own concentration camp occupied by the Soviet army after World War II. Soviet guard Sasha Novsky stands in front of his cell. There is God, Novsky. Oh. There is justice. There is reason. <coughs> there is truth. After the Americans discovered Buchenwald and occupied Weimar, they forced the citizens of Weimar to come and see the concentration on Slava for themselves. See, they didn't know what was going on in the camps. They, they didn't know what we were doing here. Just eight kilometers away. And they had no idea. The Americans didn't believe that. But it's true. I stood by the main office and had to watch them go by with their hands over the mouths and noses, tears streaming down their faces in horror. Little old ladies with grocery bags, practically painted, middle-aged professors from Bauhaus University now, with their spectacles on the tips of their noses and their creased brows shocked and disapproving. I had to stand there and watch my people hate me, hate themselves, hate being German. And it was in that moment that I knew I had done something terribly, terribly wrong. I admit it. But I can never take it back. And that's why I am here. Because not only did I kill him, I stripped man of his dignity. But in that sense, how are you any different from myself? Novsky? Novsky. How old are you, Novsky? Please, for the love of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, talk to me, please. As a fellow human being, at least grant me the decency of a response. Okay? No? I understand. Just let me tell you something. If you haven't heard anything of what I have said so far, hear this. Get out while you still can. Get out of the game while you still can, before it consumes you. Find something else, because I guarantee you it is more important than whatever the reason is that you are standing outside my door. District Land, an absurd satire of young Washington, D.C., the Obama years. Scene 11, the lobby of Richard the Congressman's office. There is muffled screaming coming from behind Richard's office door. Random sleepover girl is sitting on the sofa, very dressed up with a notepad and pen on her lap and her smartphone in her hand. She's <coughs> playing around on it, texting, tweeting, whatever. Richard emerges from his office, straightening his tie. My hello, young lady. Congressman, please allow me to introduce myself. I am here on behalf of... Yes, the lobby for saving the dogs of Bucharest. I know, such a crucial <laughs> decision. <laughs> <laughs> they shake hands in a very official, awkward, D.C. manner. I cannot tell you how distressed we all are with President Sasevsky's latest proclamation. Oh, I know. It's such a travesty. There are multiple NGOs facilitating the adoption of stray dogs from Iraq and Afghanistan. How can we as a nation overlook Romania? <laughs> Agreed. I mean, like, the Cold War happened before the war on terror. First things first. First, dogs first. <laughs> what Ceausescu created is a nightmare. Vesetsky's latest effort is forced sterilization. I am aware. Frank has thoroughly briefed me. Oh, I see. <laughs> How about we take this to my office? I met with Bridget Bardot about this in Paris last month. You know, it's a, a top priority for me and uh, the people of Minnesota. Thank you so much, Congressman. Scene <laughs> <laughs> <C> 13. <laughs> Progressive Leadership Network, PLN, happy hour. No, I get what they're talking about. In DC, you can't let your guard down. You have to be constantly aware. So, Maria? Where are you from? Tennessee, Johnston City. Uh-huh, um, I mean, originally. <laughs> right, Cuba. My father came over on a raft, met my mother in Miami when she worked as a secretary and he was a janitor. 
he took out the trash. I'm the eldest of five. My parents own a FedEx in Tennessee. I am an Aries. I went to Princeton on a full scholarship where I played field hockey. I have two Oxford degrees and I'm a presidential management fellow. And I only live with these guys because my best friend from high school, who is a total hippie, thought it would be a good idea. And I was moving to DC and desperately needed a place PDQ. Anything else you want to know? It's an impressive biography. <laughs> How did your parents meet? Oh, they were introduced at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Life According to Swami Shiva, a Theater J spoof on Life Sucks by Aaron Posner, which is a play that is a spoof on Chekhov's Uncle Vanya. Ella visits her yoga and meditation guru, Swami Shiva, in his yoga studio. Contemporary Russia. But I want it here, on my yoga mat. Take me, Shiva, destroy me. <laughs> Make me forget all of these ugly men who want to fuck me. Make love to me. I will kiss you everywhere. And by everywhere, I literally mean everywhere. I will kiss you too, Ava. Shiva kisses her on the top of the head. And with that, our session is closed. Uh, you have a lot of fire in your heart, and it is exploding on top of your head. Calm, cool, easy. We'll have a full meditation and a summer practice next week. Until then, uh, morning and night repeat our mantra silent or spoken. Find freedom in the chains that constrain you. We all must. We all do. Only then can you be truly happy. But she was. Yes, darling. We are here and now. Why not? It's never our final chance. We have the next life and then the next. Bullshit. Is it? Seems like we didn't finish the Tema Chodron, I suggest. But it is our last chance. The professor and I are bankrupt. We are selling the house and my Acura. I don't know where we are going. No more weekly meetings with my guru, Shiva. Please, <laughs> fill me with the divine. I feel so base and material. I want to unite to be light. Only you can do that for me. And uh, I have hoped it did not come to this. What do you mean? We do love each other. We care about each other. You take care of me in ways no man ever has. And even we have not yet shared that delicious moment before orgasm. We have so much more to look forward to. I'm about to be a father. What? I am in a committed relationship. <laughs> well, we are working on adoption from Kazakhstan. I hope to be a father very soon. Congratulations. Yes, Dimitri and I are really happy. I didn't tell you because of the climate since Putin's crackdown. I mean, it has gotten really dangerous for us, you know. And of course, I normally don't talk about my personal life with clients. Wait, but how is that going to work? Same-sex adoption is unheard of. My sister and her husband have applied for the child. And Dimitri and I have applied for asylum in America. We'll all meet there. Oh? Something else I don't like my clients to know. Right. Of course, I, I understand. Yes. No. Thank you, Shiva. I mean, thank you, Swati, for everything. Namaste. <laughs> in my dreams, you will continue to be a major player. <laughs> the muffins, or? Which do you think? I'll always wonder. Um, and good luck with your family life. Spasibo. Because it's a real bitch. <laughs> End of our theatrical reading. Thank you. <laughs>
So what a, what a fantastic uh, variety of, of topics, of <laughs> locales. Um, so uh, first thing, because I know that you've always got uh, stuff going on, you've got, what, what's the next steps for these? We, we were talking a little bit earlier about hopefully seeing them a few blocks north of here <laughs> sometime soon, but what, what do you have immediately coming up with these plays and more? Yeah, thank you, David. The news about Finally Quiet, four plays from Bucharest, Washington, D.C., uh, the anthology of four, is that it has been translated into Spanish. And that was very important to me because I live in Denver, Colorado, which we are a bilingual city. Um, and actually our neighbors on the left side, they're a multi-generational um, Mexican family. And all of my students for the past four years, Spanish has been their first language. So it has been my dream to actually have something in Spanish. And I was inspired because just over a year ago, I was in Romania launching my history and poetry books in Romanian translation on a national tour. I wanted to say thank you to Dorian, Daciana, and everyone else who are so supportive <laughs> as that happened and unfolded. Um, and I wanted a new challenge. I wanted to you know, move my work into another language, and Spanish made the most sense, given where I live. Um, and now we're shopping presses. I actually worked with a translator who just finished her MFA in translation from the University of Iowa, which is the best school in creative writing MFA in the country. Um, and she and I are shopping at presses here in the States and Mexico. Great. Yeah. Um, how, many, how many languages do you speak? Well, mm -hmm. I speak four, but not native. I mean, uh -huh. as, as, no, it's five, sorry. I was, yeah. Vanuatu, they speak a pigeon, which is a mix of English and French. And when I first moved there, it completely like my brain exploded because it diced up all the languages I thought I knew, and then I had to like piece them back together. Um, but so yeah, English. I studied German and French in school. I learned Romanian as an adult, and then I learned Bishlama when um, I was living in Vanuatu. And it's interesting now because I can read pigeon, like I can read Nigerian pigeon BBC. Uh -huh. So it's it's. Interesting that pigeon is similar everywhere. Um, but I learned at the Holocaust Museum when I worked. I worked there for four years as a researcher. That you know, you know, one language is actually a door to so many more. And so I can read twelve languages. Amazing. Which is awesome because my new job. I'm using those skills. I'm the senior researcher. I'm just going to talk about my day job for a second. Um, I'm the senior researcher on the Holocaust. Um, survival and Witness Project in Colorado at the University of Denver, which is um, trying to document um, all Holocaust survivors and also allies, different capacities with Colorado groups. So I'm really, and I'm teaching the Holocaust at the University of Denver as well. So that, I learned those skills working in the Holocaust. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's important to talk about um, the things that the things that you do other than playwriting. On one hand, you're a writer in genres other than playwriting. Yes. But also, um, just the fact that, that you, you do need to have a day job. The fact that you that you do other things other than playwriting, because I think that um, I think that a lot of young playwrights kind of have this romantic image in their minds of of the playwright at their writing desk, just dashing off their next masterpiece. And, and running it over to to rehearsals in a Broadway theater, and there's a lot, there's a lot of steps in between, and a lot of a lot of sources of income that are that are needed to be able to fund that kind of life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have so many thoughts. We should have a separate podcast to talk about all the thoughts. Um, but no, I mean, a lot of people um, here um, with us tonight know my dad, and um, my dad is a scientist. And my dad was always very clear, look, Christina, you need to have something seriously supporting you as you go off and do these artistic things. <laughs> um, and so it's funny, I resisted that for so long. That's what my Green Horses poetry book is about. But he was right. And I'm just so grateful that I've had this intellectual day job that has been really hard um, sustaining me because I'm making my living, I believe, making a contribution to society. <laughs> Um, and then I'm free on the creative side, and there's no money attached to my writing, and I am always writing when I feel like it. Um, that's why these plays, right, one of them tracks back to when I was in college uh -huh. at Northwestern in the 2000s, 
yeah, I mean, just, I've always been able to just write, and it wasn't until I met my partner who encouraged me to try to get everything published um, that I started trying to get my work out there. But this does connect, we talked um, in the green room about local and international. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think something that we need to encourage, and I'm saying this as a local and international artist and an educator, is that we, we need to abandon this, like I'm writing, like my income is getting my MFA, going into a mountain of debt, um, and then, you know, getting my place on Broadway. Like, there's so many ways to be an artist, and for me, it's always been getting involved in my local community. And that's how these plays have been produced and have multiple productions in various places. Um, that's just because I've been hustling and part of, you know, whatever city, living, you know, etc. So, um, I would say it's, as for theater, it's local and international, and you also have to just wake up and realize that in the United States, we don't have institutional support for artists. Mm -hmm. So rather than complain about it all the time, what are you gonna do to still make your art? Yeah. I love that you said, uh, that the term you said was having something serious to support, yes. not to fall back on. Which oh, yeah. I think is the phrase that a lot of artists here have something to fall back on, which insinuates that you will have to fall back, mm -hmm. um, rather than that you're you have a steady stream of income to support your artistic endeavors and to keep you making art, not to replace a I am doing air quotes for y'all on the podcast mm -hmm. a, a failure at being able to always be an artist yeah. um, and also I think at least for me um, I'm such a nerd <laughs> and I love that my day job is learning because that only makes me a better writer yeah um, and so I think if you look at they that they feed you know they they feed into one another they support one another and it's all kind of part of the same intellectual and cultural endeavor mm -hmm. please for me and we're gonna we're gonna get into some more of that and, and the history side of it and the, the international side. I do want to open this up also and have this be a conversation with all in attendance. Does anybody here have any questions for Christina based on what you've seen or if, if you have read or seen any, anything of hers in the past? And I open that up to our actors as well. Uh, we, do, we do have some seats open. Actors, if you want to come. I'll keep going. I'll keep going if we don't keep thinking, and I'll come back to everyone. So um, clearly, with a play like Book Involved, that is steeped in history, and it was so. It was interesting to learn that the inspiration from it was your experience going to the camp, uh, but obviously the text of the play is steeped in history. Uh, but I know that you have other other things and, and some, sometimes satirical that, that touch a little bit closer directly to your experiences. So can you talk to me a little bit about where your interest for history at large meets your interest for your own personal history and your own international travels? Um, well, in so foreign languages were my favorite subject in school, and in addition to that, history those three, German, French, and history. Um, and then becoming a historian was, it was very much a happy accident. Um, as I say, you know, in the bio that you read, I went to college to become an actor, um, where I realized that I'm actually a nerd. They're not mutually exclusive, but. Um, <laughs> and I had a professor, a philosophy professor, recommend that I apply for international fellowships. Um, and I won the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, and so I had this opportunity to get a PhD in history, but it, was, it wasn't like that was what I was planning on. It was, um, it just was this beautiful gift. And I thought, well, I'm gonna make the most out of this. And that's when I moved to Romania and really immersed myself, not just in the language, but in the cultural scene. That's when we did Colombo Calling. Um, that's when the beginning of Bucharest inside the Beltway, that's when all that started. Um, and then 
And then that became this engine for the day job that we've been talking yeah. about. So I had the training and the skills and everything, and then that is what I was either teaching or I was doing research, and that's what I've done to support myself. But I think on the personal side, it's really being the child of an immigrant, and particularly growing up during the Cold War, where you have this geopolitical reality that is shaping everything that you see and hear about. And it's, I mean, it's, I, I said to the actors when we met on Zoom, like, it was really scary. I mean, the 80s were scary. I was born into a scary <laughs> reality. My father had fled Romania in 1969 as a student, and then he broke Romanian law by staying in the US. He became an enemy of the state, and the secret police was following him and all of my mom's family here and his family in Galatz, and like, that's the 70s and 80s, I come into the picture. And we just, we thought we would never go to Romania. And so I always knew this history because of my dad's bedtime stories of his youth in Romania and both of his parents had been, I mean, I feel like a lot of the Romanians already know these stories, but so both of his parents had disappeared at different times, um, um, you know, disappeared. Um, and he had a couple uncles in labor camps, also known as the Gulag. Um, and so I always knew this stuff growing up. And I think when you have real 20th century, that was my century, history, <laughs> that's part of your family and your reality. And you're also, I was just very keenly aware that all of the people I was growing up with in North Carolina like didn't understand. Um, and that was always very frustrating. So I would say on the academic side and then this very obvious uh, what what brought you to Romania ultimately? Oh, that's really sensitive. <laughs> Do we have to talk about that? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I was running away. So, well, first of all, I had to do my PhD. Uh -huh. So I won a Fulbright, and I was studying at the University of Bucharest, and I had to do all my research. But I do believe the reason that I never felt, because, like, I'm a Rhodes Scholar, I'm an American Rhodes Scholar, and that's its own, like, unfortunately, and everybody comes back to the States and like works for McKinsey or you know somehow launches their, you know, you can imagine the stereotypes. They're all in district like. Um, and I never felt that pressure, and so I felt free to stay in Romania, which I did. And that was because something very difficult happened to me when I was a graduate student at Oxford. And I, in a way, was like running away from the United States. Um, but I'm grateful for that because I got to live World. Yeah. So I lived in Sri Lanka, I lived in Vanuatu, I lived um, obviously in the UK and Romania. So everything works out. But I think another thing that we talked about pipeline, like playwrights thinking they have to do it a certain way, you need to allow for life like happening to you and just going with the flow. Yeah. Um, you know, it's also more interesting. By the time you're in your 40s, I'm like, oh, I have a really interesting life so far. <laughs> And obviously this affects the stories that you want to tell. Yes. So um, so how, how you identify as an international playwright because you've been all over the world and your stories as a result come from all over the world. Uh, so th this, kind, this is kind of an extension of what I'm saying. Um, can you talk a little bit about how uh, your personal experiences all over the world and your sense of history that I'm sure you bring wherever you go, and I'm sure a curiosity for the history of wherever you go, uh, how that plays into what you choose to write, what stories you choose to tell. Well, it's never intellectual with me. A play just comes to me, and I, I keep thinking about it, thinking about it when I'm walking. We have two fur dogs and fur cats, but when I'm walking with fur dogs, um, and I'm like, I have to write this play. And that's what happened with my most recent I wrote with James Brunt, who's Denver's most prominent African American actor, and um, it is a an examination of the history of the Rhodes Scholarship, inspired by Black Lives Matter and Rhodes Must Fall, which is basically the Black Lives Matter of Oxford trying to get rid of the statue of Cecil Rhodes, um, and that involves history. So there's this whole like history teacher student thing going on, and then we take it and play each character. Um, and, and that wasn't intellectual. All of what was going on during the pandemic, BLM, 
um, you know, after George Floyd's murder and have, you know, like it, it was it was the climate in the air. I was like, we have to write this play. We had all these COVID safe rehearsals on each side of the dining room table. Um, we performed it on Zoom with professional production and then we did it in London, which you read in the bio. That's a great example because life just happens. And since we did the scholarship, I have spoken to a social justice playwright and director in South Africa named Mike Von Gran. He's a very well-known um, critic and satirist of um, the government. And he thinks that we should bring it to the National Arts Festival of South Africa next summer and then take it on tour across the country. So I think we should too. I mean, I'm like, Mike, yes. yes, yes we should, Mike. Um, and then after that, I want to take it to Rose House because that's just, oh gosh, that would just bring that. I mean, I think everyone, yeah. Anyway, Rose is actually doing a great job of being up, decolonizing and talking about these things. But um, so that's, that's an international plan that happened naturally. Nice. So how does the, uh, since you say that you, you don't initially approach plays intellectually or academically, um, how does the, how does the social activism fit in? Is that something that is kind of always on your mind when you're thinking of a new story to tell? Or do you kind of like get halfway through and go, oh, well, damn, did it again? <laughs> um, I think that, you know, I, I really appreciate, Dorian, that you mentioned the activism advocacy part of me. It's just part of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think that a lot of my creative work social justice driven um, and you know for different causes depending what the topic is um, I can tell you the next play I'm writing which I'm developing I, I was a, a resident playwright at Boulder Ensemble Theater um, and it's a play about my grandmother's life my grandmother um, my mom's mom was born on a farm in eastern Colorado to Danish and Irish uh, American parents and um, it's an opportunity to look at difficult Colorado history, the Springfield history, and they were harassed and discriminated against by the KKK because they were a Catholic family. Um, there was also a Japanese population were coming out of those internment camps. And she had a Japanese neighbor, like a lot of, and then eventually when we get to desegregation of the 60s and how, she, how that was in her life, Coloradans are obsessed with being from Colorado, so uh -huh. I'm going to write the most. It's called Born Colorado, this play. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so they're going to have to take it seriously. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to open it up again if anyone has any questions based on what you've heard about uh, these plays, about playwriting, about, and again, if not, we've still got a bit of time, I can keep going. Yes? What are any specific principles or just ideas that you really love to and uh, share with your audience? Uh, maybe like teaching lessons or anything of, of like these. What kind of lessons are you teaching? Yeah, well, and are there any principles that you, that you find, if I'm getting, are there any principles that you find you keep coming back to or lessons yes. that you want to teach through your writing? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. I think that the description of Finally Quiet, um, how the plays capture the universal beating of the human heart, is what I want to celebrate in my place. Um, you know, celebrate our differences, but also our shared humanity. That's something I say to my students all the time. And um, yeah, I and mean, that's why theater, I did watch the Tonys, and um, there was there are a couple of great speeches about how theater is the space to celebrate and investigate the human condition. And that's why I'm a theater artist. Um, and um, so I wouldn't say, Principles, I would say, a celebration of being human, and also there's the advocacy piece. Whatever cause I feel like fighting for, the scholarship. Let's decolonize the roads, you know, for Colorado. Let's talk about the KKK. Whatever it is um, that drives the play. We were talking upstairs about the fact that theater is inherently political. Yes. Always has been and always will be. Um, and you, what you brought up also made me think of George C. Wolfe's speech on, on Sunday night when he said that uh, he appreciated his parents taking him to see theater 
of other cultures because it didn't have to look like you to be about you. Mm, yes, exactly. No, and I want to, that's, you know, now that we're nearing the end, that's a great note to be ending on, is my parents. My mom took me and my siblings, and we dragged my dad, to as many theater productions and museums and dance performances like we were inhaling culture in Durham, North Carolina. And she would drive us up to Washington and go to the Kennedy Center. Like, and that was just, and that was all my mom. And um, yeah, so I, I agree. I think if you're exposed to it from a young age, then um, you have an open mind and heart to, to be part of it. I think I saw a question here and then we'll bounce over here. Yeah. Um, I wanted just to ask more about your writing process. I know you said that an idea comes to you and then you're walking the dogs and then you have, you feel like you just want to write it down, but um, do you feel like you're uncovering a story or that as you start writing, it just kind of, I guess that's the same thing, uncovering, it just flows, or do you feel like you have the idea already and then you to write. Now. We have a question over here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, making an expression in one language that's you know, part of the culture of that language and then putting it in another language and then suddenly it's this wonderful metaphor that nobody heard about it. And, you know, uh, Green Horses on the Wall is a great example from Romania. Uh, Andrei Kondrescu mentioned about uh, writing about which in Romanian, yeah, it's okay, but when you put it in English, you might be, oh, what a great song. So I, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> well um, I'm, I am honored that you mentioned me in the same breath as Andre Kudrescu, so I'm going to leave here tonight with that. Thank you, John. Um, but it's funny about Green Horses on the Walls, that's my poetry book and it is an expression in Romanian um, that isn't the most complimentary. Um, but in English and in the poems, it's to have impossible dreams and to be an artist, ultimately. Um, and it's funny, my dad takes credit for it now. He's like, see, I gave you that title for your great book. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but not in a good way. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think it's, uh, that's a phrase that meant something so personal and sensitive to me my entire life, but then rebranding it in this like empowered way on the front of my poetry book, it's kind of like I was able to sort of, um, yeah, like leave all those doubts in the dust or something. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think we can have something mean one thing, um, you know, in the case of that saying, not very positive, but then kind of own it and make it something better. and. Um, also, I've said in interviews before, sometimes, like writing poems, especially in between languages, sometimes something is better said in one language than the other. And see, yeah, I see Adela nodding. She writes trilingual poetry as well. Um, and I do think that's a really wonderful gift because you're able to express these things or you share a language with somebody. Um, you know, I only speak to my Matushin Balats in Romanian, for example. So, but I speak to my dad in English only in English, right? So, that will determine, you know, what you're saying and um, what those words mean. So, probably didn't answer your question, but. but I, I like what you said about taking, taking something from your culture that has a negative 
we're using this word a lot of history, um, and turning it into something positive. Because I feel from the selection that I've gotten to know in preparation for tonight and tonight, that, that you seem to be doing, that you're, you're not tackling easy topics. <laughs> no. Um, but, but these also aren't plays that are, uh, that are dour, or that there, there is hope to them. There is kind of looking towards a brighter future with these. Well, um, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I am, I am optimistic. I wouldn't be an educator if I didn't think that, we're, that we could make things better. Um, no, I mean, my spoken word stage name is Lady Godiva, which means to speak the hard truths. I've always been terribly opinionated. I wrote the um, op-ed column in my high school newspaper, and all of the teachers hated me because I kept pointing out uh, all of the things wrong with that place. So, yeah, I'm going to keep being me, um, okay. but in a sort of like constructive, critical way with my art. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to seeing what all of those are. We look forward to having you back when we've got new publications on our shelves right here in the B section. Yeah, I like, look at that. Yeah, I like to, I like to walk around the room my next room. This is going to be my section. So that's your section right over there. Yay. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you all. We hope to see you at future events. Follow our event, right? And follow uh, at Drama Book Show Podcast on Instagram to, uh, to find out when new episodes drop and when we've got new events coming up. And uh, for right now, uh, we're going to ask you to wait right where you are for the moment. Our resident Disney line leader, Mark, is going to file you over to the front of the store one row at a time. And Christina and I are going to meet you over there to get your books signed. So once more, thank you very much. Just <laughs>